Okay, so the first thing, right, is a reminder that uh, we have a midterm on Thursday. We have a midterm on Thursday. This is again a full day. Take home. Okay, so it's a four day take home exam. We have the homework due Wednesday at 6 p.m. Okay, right? And the midterm will cover to type two turbines. So basically, wherever we got uh, in the homework. So before we go to uh, new materials, any questions about the midterm or the homework? All right, so again, the difficulty of the midterm will be similar to the homework questions. Similar to the homework, there will be one question at the end where the folks taking 551 should attempt and the folks taking 451 can treat that as a bonus question. Okay, so it'll be without one question like that as the, that's the last question on the midterm. The assumption is that you have access to a software that can plot nonlinear functions. Okay, so the assumption is you have access to something like MATLAB okay, or equivalent, right, for this midterm. Okay. Other than that, uh, as long as there's no communications, then it's open everything. You're free to you know, Google stuff if you want to. Okay. Any questions, concerns? Okay, so one note is try the questions early so you have time to ask. Uh, you know, either come to the class time to ask me or email to ask me. Right. If you say email me some, if you want clarification for a question after 8 p.m., there's no guarantee I can get back to you in time. Okay, so you want to at least give it a try in the morning if you have time. Okay, at least attempt the exam in the morning. All right, so other than that, let's uh, review what we did last time. Right? So last time we started looking at the polytronics converters, basically AC to DC converter. Right? So this is a half wave converter. And the half wave converter is quite simple. Right? So if the input Vs, this sort of sine wave, then the output, let's see, V T, uh, just half, you know, as part of the uh, this sort of thing. Okay, this is V T, and for us, this is D C. Okay, so DC means any signal that's non-negative. Okay, All right. So again, we're not going to worry about filtering in this class. As long as you get it to be non-negative, you get the voltage to be non-negative, we'll take that as a DC voltage. Okay, so of course you have to filter this, right, to make it roughly constant. But for us, that's not the main concern. Right? We're just interested in the, say the average or the room mean square values. Okay? So not so much that whether you can make, you know, how constant you can make this voltage. We'll assume there are some filter that designed to do this, okay? right? So this is my half wave converter, right? so-called half wave rectifier. Now, of course, the problem with this halfway rectifier is only lets you know part of the part of the input waveform go through. Right? So more than 50% of the time, you're not on, right? You're off. And that's inefficient, right? You're losing voltage where you don't have to lose voltage. So we can easily have 
a full wave rectifier, right? This is a single phase full wave AC to DC conversion. So again, I'm assuming that uh, we have all seen this before, this full wave converter before. And the design of this is quite simple, right? The design of this is basically, you take two dials and two SCRs, and you alternatively turn them on and off, right? So during one half of the wave, you turn on the blue path, during another half of the wave, you turn on the right path. Okay, this is the simple logic of how this system works, how this dial system works. So this dial does, you alternate the path. So basically what you can have is at some time, so either blue or only one of blue or red is passes conducting, right? So only one of blue or red right? So you only allow one to pass to conduct. And during one cycle, you have the red conducting, during another cycle, you have the blue conducting, and the you can get a five, four wave rectification, right? So red will conduct during when the input let's say is positive and blue will conduct when the input is negative. Okay. So it's very easy to get this kind of, uh, to get this to work. But all you need to, all you need is two SCRs and two dials. That's all you need with this kind of circuit. And uh, you can pull out basically the, uh, you get the blue during when this is positive, you get the red when the input wave is negative. And during each part, you, ca you capture uh, part of the input voltage. Okay, so this is a full wave AC to DC rectifier, AC to DC converter, because it's active in both the positive and negative cycle. Any question with this? Any questions about the circuit? Okay, so in this circuit, right, we have two SCRs and two dials. Right? Why not have all four SCRs? Or I guess a better question is this, right? So you can have this kind of SCR and diode. In the past, you may have seen a full wave rectifier with switches, right? So it's also common to see a full wave rectifier with this kind of switching structure, where you turn, right? where you turn these switches in sequence. So you can build them with switches and you can have blue and red. So sim similarly, we can have, let's say this is blue switches. This is red switches. We can have switching instead of dials, right? So which one is better or what's the advantage and disadvantage of these doing, achieving this with switches compared using SCR and dials? Right, so if you look at the top circuit, we use SCR and dials. Is there a drawback to using that? Using this SCR and dials? Do you see some potential drawbacks here? So Chad, Michael says both are drawback cross components, so that's one concern, right? So for diode, we have a 0.7 volt drop, SCR will also have a voltage drop. Uh, for high power applications, 0.7 volts is not all that large. 
we're normally not so concerned about this sort of voltage drop. But associated with voltage drop, there's a question of efficiency, right? And the sizing of all these components. So we can use SCRs on diodes, but these are not small devices, right? These are not the most efficient of devices. Okay, so they do stop uh, current flow, but you suffer a loss. And the size of SCR is, you know, you cannot make SCR too small, it's sort of this big. Okay? So when you want to put on the board, it takes up a lot of uh, real estate on your board. Okay? Or our switches can be made much smaller. Okay? There's, I can, we can make uh, you know, tiny, tiny switches. So what, do you see any, then why would we sometimes prefer to use SCR rather than switches? So SCR are large, bulky, inefficient, but why would they be sometimes more preferred than using a switching architecture? Like the one below. Maybe they're easier to control? In what sense are they easier to control? Um, uh, for, um, I don't know, I guess it, like to, tr to trigger an SCR, it's just a, it's just a, like a voltage signal, right? right. So um, I don't know, like closing a, a physical switch is going to be a more involved process, maybe hard, maybe harder to. Uh, no, right. So these are not physical switches. Think of this as transistors. So let me be clear what the switches are. Right? The reason we can make switches very efficient and very small, is these are solid state MOSFET transistors. I think. And they're gauge driven devices. Right? So it's a, a sort of, but it's not hard to close them, so it's trivial to close them. Right, so think of if you have a switching architecture, what are you afraid of? When you operate a switch based, actually when any time when you operate a full wave rectifier, what are you most afraid of as a circuit designer? Right? Any suggestions? What, what are you concerned about whenever you have this sort of full waves converter? Okay, right. Whenever you offer this, right, reverse voltage, right? Or you have basically power to grab being connected. What you're most afraid of is your blue and red paths are on at the same time. Okay, when that happens, you're sure your supply. Okay, so you should never short your power supply, right? You never, you should never short a supply voltage. That, you know, either blows things up or your trigger protection and this whole thing no longer works, okay? So you're most afraid of is whenever your ground touches your power, basically, that's what you, you, you worry about short. So in switching, of course, if you don't, if you don't control the switching signal correctly, you, you don't time them correctly, there is a concern that by the time you close the blue switch, you may not have opened the red one yet. If that happens, you have a short, you have a, you short the circuit and uh, very bad things happen. You know, if you have shorter circuit, okay. Can that happen with SCR? Could I short the circuit on top? Is it possible to short the circuit on top? Is it possible? Is there a way I can short it? The diodes would prevent it. Right, the diodes and the SCR prevent it, right? You have a positive trigger yet, right? So you, the SCRs have a positive trigger yet. SCR only triggers when the voltage gets to a certain level. But at that time, the other, the other SCR would have turned off because the other SCR turns off when voltage costs zero. You turn on when the voltage only gets to a certain positive number. Okay, so there is a built in buffer though. Right? There is a built in buffer for you to operate. In. Okay, there's a buffer then for you to operate. In. The two SCRs cannot be on at the same time right? because I have a sine wave. So there's no way for the blue and red SCR to be on at the same time. If they cannot be on at the same time, I cannot show this circuit. And this goes back to the advantage of SCR is triggered by its own input voltage. So you don't need an external 
uh, sort of circuit clock, right? That controls when you're on, when you're open, and when you're closed. Okay, so this is quite robust circuit design. As by design, I cannot short the circuit. Okay, so it's more safety, right? It's safer. Although it's, uh, you know, just bulkier and uh, less efficient, but at least you, you don't short these, you can't short the circuit, right? So now there's a lot of advancing power electronics, actually all different power levels. Let's basically try to merge the benefit of SDR, where you control by your own voltage, with the fact that it's much easier, you know, to use MOSFET switches, okay, use MOSFET transistors. So if you if you take circuit design, you may hear something called zero voltage switching. And that's essentially you're trying to replicate what this SCR does in a you know integrated, more integrated circuit. Okay. Right. So just remember for our design, if you don't have an explicit you know, transistor switch, we don't worry about ever the shorting the circuit. But when you have a turning angle alpha, that's a gap. Alpha cannot be too small. And uh, you know, we're less efficient. So these are sort of large devices, right? In our circuit. Okay, so there's some trade-off to be in mind, right? Any questions about this or full way? Okay, so forever, whoever goes on design this, you know, there's a, yeah, so pay attention, we will see zero voltage switching. As it tells you how to do this kind of switching using its own voltage as a signal for the switching signal. All right, so that's the circuit setup. Again, it's very, very simple in our case, okay? Just put you know, two dials to SCR together, we have a converter. Again, filtering will assume is done by somebody else at the end, okay? So there's some filtering at the end, All right? So we can, of course, again, compute the average voltage and the root mean square voltage. Right. It's given by the exact same equation as before. Uh, there's no need to go through this computation. Right? So it just, uh, you, for the average, we average one over pi. Right? So something to note, this is averaging, the average is over pi rather than two pi, okay, we're gonna average or pi rather than two pi. And the reason uh, this is not periodic with a period of pi. So this thing has a, right, of pi. It's repeated, but the positive part and the negative part of the input voltage is exactly repeat the same way. Okay, so now it has a period over pi. You, you integrate from alpha to pi, and uh, you get the average voltage. The RMS voltage, same thing. You integrate, uh, you know, you can integrate from this one, for example, one over pi, integrate from alpha to pi, square the thing inside, take a square root, and uh, you get whatever you get as the average voltage. All right, any questions about this? Okay, so we're not gonna do the integral. We're not gonna do the integral, but uh, it's good to understand wh where this integral come from. Okay. Then you can again compute the RMS voltage, right? So it's uh, not much to be said about uh, this computation. It's simply just a, a straightforward computation like this. Okay. All right, and then we talk about power. Again, remember power is always the RMS quantity divided by R or R times the RMS square. Okay? So it's always the RMS voltage or current quantities that gives you power. And uh, this, when you square this RMS voltage divided by R, this is the power we get. And this is a power three resistor. All right, any questions for this? 
this is just to give you a place where you can find the equations. Again, not much more is that than just sort of straightforward computation, okay? straightforward integrals. Okay, so now if you look at the average and the full wave, so this is an important table, right? This is an important table and uh, summarizes all the equations we have. And the key thing to note is the average for the half wave is one half, or let me write it this way. Yeah, so two times the average for the half wave is the average for the full wave. Okay. So the average voltage differ by a factor of two, but the RMS voltage differs by a factor of root two. Okay. So the RMS voltage differ by a factor of root two, right? and then the power differ by a factor of two, right? So this is again why we have to talk about the power in terms of the RMS voltage squared. When you talk about the RMS voltage squared, not the average voltage squared, right? Because the RMS voltage squared, right? So if you compare the full wave and half wave, basically for the full wave, you get the, you know, you get the signal twice, you got the voltage twice in the cycle. So of course you deliver twice the power, right? Deliver twice the power. However, if you compute power from the average voltage, you if you square this, it's a you no, know, it's a factor of four difference, which is not true, right? Which is not correct. So since we want power to go up by a factor of two, we square the voltage. So again, the correct voltage to use is the RMS voltage. Right? RMS voltage is the correct one to use. Any questions for this table, for how we get it? Okay, so this is, for us, this, this table summarizes everything about AC to DC converters. Summarize AC to DC converters, right? And uh, uh, so you just need to know where to find this table. I just need to know where to find this table. And be careful when you scale uh, various quantities from half wave to full wave. Okay, so remember the average goes up by a factor of two, power goes up by a factor of two, but the RMS quantities goes up by a factor of square root of two. Okay. So that's just a difference between the two. Okay. So after the AC to DC converter, we have DC to AC converters, right? We have now have DC to AC converter. So DC to AC converter, right? So we would look at DC to AC converter. So how would we design a DC to AC converter? Let's say I have a DC source like this. How do I do DC to AC? Given the well, we know how to convert AC to DC. So how do we do DC AC? It's quite simple, right? So we know how to do AC DC. Right? So I think the child says this is, you just reverse the full wave converter, right? It's basically the same thing. This is a full wave. All right, so you run a, you again, you attach a full wave. Converters, but this time we have to do it with switches. Oh man. Uh, do you guys see what I write on the slide? No? Okay, this thing got stuck again, so I'm trying to fix this again.
Anybody know why I started doing this? I never have never done this before, but until this few weeks, uh, sort of start getting stuck in this kind of thing. Yeah, it is an Apple device as I've had, so I don't know. Is that had now not working? All right, so does this work? Can you see me? Okay, all right, good. Yeah, I think even my iPad has had enough Zoom. <laughs> it wants to be over with. But uh, yeah, so let's, let's see. Uh, I may need a new iPad. Okay, so let's uh, continue, right? So DC to AC is basically a rectifier run backwards. Right? You switch the load and the supply and you run the whole thing, you know, you do the same thing again, right? Basically. Yeah. So this is our DC to AC conversion. The issue with this conversion here is you have to do switches. Okay, so Q1 to Q4, these are, you can think of as a semiconductor, let's say bipolar DJT switches. Okay, All right, so these are transistors, these are switches. Then the idea of the timing is important. Okay. So you better time this correctly. Again, here you do not want red, red and blue to be on at the same time. Okay. That will short the supply. Okay. So you want to uh, you want to make sure you time the switches correctly. Now, such that blue and the red should not never on the same time. Right. This is switching a correct way. That is, so how you do this, how you time this, is a little bit beyond this course, but there's something to keep in mind of. But other than that, we get this sort of square wave, right? We'll get this sort of square wave. And this square wave is an AC signal. We're gonna think of this as an AC signal because it has both positive and negative values. You can filter this again to get a sinusoid out of it, okay? So, Right, you can filter this to get a sinusoid, right? So if you are a solar panel, right? So basically you just describe how a solar panel works. This is a solar panel. Solar panel is a DC voltage. It generates a DC voltage. And to interface with the grid, the AC grid, the solar, you need to convert this DC voltage generated by the solar panel to the AC grid. So you do this through this DC to AC conversion. And uh, you convert to a square wave, then you basically modulate the square wave to become a sine wave. And you modulate the square wave to become sine wave. And this is also called inverter. Okay, so a DC-AC converter is called an inverter because this, uh, I guess, inverts the DC or something. You have an inverter signal, some, you know, some reason like that. But you generate this sort of AC signal. So the filtering and all that is, uh, again, we're assuming there's some, some way to filter this. Yeah. It's not trivial to make this into a 60 hertz, you know, nicely looking AC signal, but it can be done. Okay. So we're gonna assume that somebody will do this, okay. right? So then for us, the next one we can look at as the DC-DC converters. Right, so DC DC in some sense are relatively simple compared to this for the DC AC, but still uh, uh, they're, they're very important in our system. So they're still important for us. Okay, so let's look at DC to DC. So DC to DC, there, there's obvious there's, you know, what converters you can have. 
you have a buck converter, which is a step down converter, right? You have a high voltage, you want a lower voltage as the output. So this is, for example, your, you know, you have a lot of conversion like this inside your computer, right? It needs to take a high voltage signal okay, from the wall socket and convert it to 12 volts and convert to, you know, 1.7 volts into your board. So just lock buck converter. Of course, you may have a step up converter. You have a buck boost. You have a boost converter that takes a low voltage, converts to a higher voltage. So that's also doable. Then there is a step down, step up, buck boost converter. So anybody remember what that does? What does a buck boost converter do? Anybody remember that? If I have a buck, we have a boost. Why do, why, why do we invent something called a buck boost converter? It can step up and step down. Right, but why, you know, I, I can already step up and step down, right? And there's not that many applications where I need to step up and step down in the same application. So why do we invent this one? Or why do we use this one? Can I remember another application for this? Think about it, right? So I can step down, I can step up. There is another thing I may want to do is to reverse the polarity of my voltage. Okay, basically what you also want to do is flip the positive and negative rails. Okay, so this is, polarity means the positive become negative, Right, so for example, what you may want is let's say I have five volts in and I want minus five volt out. Okay. This is for example, what this buck boost converter can do. It can flip the positive and negative rails for you and flip the reference. Uh, why would this be important? Think, can you think of uh, what application we want that can flip this? So why may we want to flip this uh, polarity of the voltage? All right, so anybody uses USB-C device? Anybody has a USB-C device? Right, so for USB-C, what happens is it doesn't matter which way you plug it in. Okay? So anybody, if you have an older USB device, remember there always may be a chance that once you know there's a certain way that you can only plug the cable into. Okay? There for many devices, there's a certain way. So for example, I don't know if I can show you this. Right? So if you have a, for example, I have a cable like this, right? This, are, this is a older generation. This cable, you can only plug in a certain way, right? The jacks are, the sockets are designed, you can go a certain way, right? So if you have an older generation iPhone, you know, for folks who have these older generation iPhones, a charging cable only goes in one way. Whereas nowadays you have a charging cable, all charging cables, you can flip it around. It doesn't matter which way you're going to, right? That requires a polarity being flipped somewhere. Okay, so whenever you have this sort of, you know, different ways you can plug things into it. Some circuit internally to the converter flips a polarity, so everything goes correctly. Okay, so often in applications, actually we want to you know, not limit the way that the positive and negatives are defined. Okay, so this is a, we may want a buck boost converter. Okay. Any questions about these three types? Okay, so these are the three most common ones. There are definitely not all of it. Okay, there are other converters you can use, right? There are other converters, for example, you can uh, construct. 
But for us, let's just look at the uh, three, the most common one. So let's look at buck, right? Buck converter. Buck converter is really simple. Okay, sort of. It's uh, they don't need even a capacitor or an inductor to do a buck converter. Okay, all you need to do is a switch. Okay, so remember this is a. I'm gonna assume this is ideal switch. Okay, this is ideal switch for us. So this transistor is ideal switch. So if we have an ideal switch like that. What happens is, right, so the Vs, the source voltage is a constant voltage, right? This is a DC to DC converter. So this is a source voltage that's constant. Okay? And then if we switch on and off the switch, what we get is the switch we see over the load, the voltage we see through the load is basically if the switch is on, I see the source voltage. If the switch is off, I don't see anything. So I have open in my circuit. Then the thing turns on again, and I see this kind of voltage. Right? So this is a bar converter. And the idea is I have T on, the time is on. I have T off, and this is over a period of tau. All right, so and my, so if you look at the average voltage, the average voltage, this average voltage is again the integral over one period. But this signal is only on, right? This is only on over from zero to T on, Vs dt, this is T on over tau times Vs, this is K times Vs, K is again the duty cycle or the duty ratio. K is the duty cycle. Any question about this? Okay, so what's the RMS voltage in this case? Then? Right, so this is something to think about for the DC to DC, okay? So uh, we'll revisit this in a homework later. So not this week, but next week we'll look at a little bit into the RMS things for DC circuits, okay? So we'll do that, we'll work that through, through a homework question. Okay. So something to think about, but otherwise the calculation is quite simple. Okay? Otherwise the calculation is quite simple. Right. So, for example, I, I can have a switching frequency of five kilohertz, have a Vs of uh, 12 volts, the average I want at the output is five volts. I want to calculate how long was T up, right? So for how many, let's say milliseconds as the, as the switch on, right? right? And this is quite simple to do for this buck converter because we know that the duty ratio is T on over tau. This is the average voltage over the source voltage. So five over 12. And if you know the switching frequency, if you know the switching frequency, then the period is simply one over the switching frequency. Okay. And this is, one over five kilohertz. So we get a switching frequency of 0.2 milliseconds. 
Then T on, if you look at the first first equation as the duty cycle multiplied by the period, so five over 12 times 0 0.2, we get 0 0.0834 milliseconds. Right, so this type of question is quite easy to do. So this is a step down converter. Okay, so really simple converter. Uh, doesn't need anything other than a switch. And the other converter we can look at, for example, the step up one is a little bit more complicated. A step up conversion is more complicated. So step up converter, this is called a boost converter. If you look at it, needs a capacitor, needs an inductor, needs a diode and a switch. So a lot more components. So compare this circuit to this circuit where you only need a switch. Okay, step down, I don't need a switch. I don't need anything else. Step up, I need all this RLC elements. Right? I need the, this kind of conversion elements. So why, intuitively, why is it more complicated to build a step up than a step down? Right? So of course we can go through this circuit and analyze it and this, this circuit works, right? This is how we build the step up converter. But intuitively, why are we doing this? So I can ask the question another way. Can you construct a step up converter without let's say an inductor? Is it possible? Are we, do we just not figure out why not? I guess you, um, you need some, you need some uh, component to store the energy in order to, in order to raise the voltage. Right, uh, so that's, that's the idea, right? So without an inductor or capacitor, I cannot raise the voltage because I need storage in the system. Okay, and this storage is not, you're not getting net, right? So remember this, we're not getting more power out of this converter. This converter by itself does not generate any power. What we need is, is when the switch is in such a way, when this, let's say when the switch is in such a way that the source is not connected to the output, what I need is I need to charge up the inductor. I need to charge up the inductor with current so that I can put, and so that such that I can raise a voltage. Okay, I need some storage element to raise a voltage. I cannot simply disconnect the source from the uh, output, the source from the load. Okay, so that's why you cannot build a simpler step up converter, right? So let's look at how this thing works. Okay, so remember for when we analyze this kind of circuits, all we do is, is often we want to look at when the switch is on versus when the switch is off. Right, so when the switch is on, and this is off, okay. when the switch is on, as you know, become a certain, we have two basically distinct circuits and we're switching between them. We want to understand what happens in each of these phases. So what happens when it's on, what happens when it's off. So the, you know, there are several principles. We're not gonna solve any differential equations. So ideally, you analyze this thing by solving the differential equation of the current flow on the inductors. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna take a more simplistic view. We're gonna look at this as, so we're gonna to remember to analyze this two different uh, operation settings. The first is the inductor cannot, uh, permanently store power. Okay, so what happens as I have an inductor, this inductor basically we're charging and discharging across this inductor. Okay, we're charging and discharging across this. The current through the inductor 
as unit direction. Basically, it only goes from left to right in our in our circuit. But why is the current unit? Why is the current only going one direction? Why does this current only go from left to right? So what does the diode do? Uh, we have a DC source, but also because we have a diode, right? So this diode is basically put there to make sure current only goes in one direction. Right? You only have going one direction. Right? We want the current to always enter from the source into the inductor and being pulled out of the inductor. So we don't want the sort of reverse current flow and things like that. Okay, so, so we have a diode. Right, so then what does the capacitor do? Right, so we need an inductor because my inductor needs to store current when the switch is on, right? I need a diode as I want unidirectional current flow. What does my capacitor do? Why, why do I have a capacitor in the circuit? Can I do it without a capacitor? Uh, it maintains the output voltage when the switch is turned on. Right. So what this does is maintains the alpha voltage, right? This is what this capacitor do is it holds the alpha voltage fairly constant. Okay. So this capacitor, the cap, voltage. And this, what this means is that the voltage across the inductor switches. Changes size. Okay, so you have an inductor that's basically sitting there as voltage across the flips around. So you're charging and discharging energy. And what that does, at least to you can maintain a higher output voltage. Okay, so that's what it does. Okay, so we're not going to explicitly analyze the row of the capacitor. So we're not going to include the capacitor in our equations. But the, the important to remember the capacitor is there to hold the voltage at the output. Okay, so it's this thing that makes the voltage output more stiff. Okay. Right. So if you look at the operation of this, as my circuit, you know, when it's on and off, there's two distinct uh, ways. So if you look at delta i, which is the, uh, not delta i, but let's look at the current across the inductor. Okay, let's look at the current across the inductor. And let's analyze this when it's, so this is T, right? So let's say if this is zero to T R, okay? and say so we're starting at the current here. So what happens when the circuit is, when the switch is off? So you basically have this a voltage source, a DC voltage source, connect to an inductor and just short it, right? Just sort of return path to the source. What happens to the current? If I just put a DC voltage source across the inductor, right? The current has an increase, right? So the, the DI, remember DI DT is proportional to the voltage across the inductor, right? So my DI DT, that's the governing equation for my inductor. Okay, so what this inductor does is it has to charge. Okay, this current, right, this current through the inductor has to charge at this point. Then let's say I have T off here. Okay, when do I have T off? So remember our operating assumption and that remember, Right, so recall that Vt is larger than Vs. Okay. Recall this, right? Have a larger voltage across this. And when I have a larger voltage, right? So now the inductor is looking at a larger voltage at the right hand side compared to the left hand side. What happens is you discharge current. 
Hey, okay, this part correct. But since we're we're gonna assume that there's no net storage of kernel in the inductor, what happens is you come back to the same level. Okay, you come back to the same level. So you charge, you discharge current, you basically slosh this delta i around in the circuit. Okay, we have this kind of operation that goes on, right? And uh, our idea is one to relate Vt to T on and T off, right? So how much this gets charged and how much gets discharged relate to how long I leave it on versus how long I leave it off. Right, and so we want to relate the output voltage basically to the duty cycle, right? So a lot of times you come down to duty cycle or something related to duty cycle, right? okay. So as again, to remember it has, so this is my voltage and current picture, right? My voltage and current picture. So the idea is the, these two are about, are the, sort of the, you need to give out the increase and decrease the net changing current averages out in one cycle. But right? that's sort of the key equation I have in my inductor. So the net current in one cycle is zero. Right? So I don't, I cannot, you know, permanently keep a current increase or permanently decrease a current in the inductor. We have to net out. Okay, you have to net out something. Okay. So if you look at this, then again, if you look at the basic equations for the circuit, here we have V voltage across the circuit as L di dt. Bi dt is the rate of change in the current. But uh, what I have is, so L di dt, I have, what I have is the amount of change I on over T on as the I dt. Okay, so that gives you rate of change. And that this equals to Vs. Okay, so the voltage across, when the switch is off, when the switch is on, the voltage across the inductor is Vs. Okay, this is Vs. And then I have a, this Vs drives a net changing current at a rate of delta i on over delta t on. Similarly, similarly, if I look at the voltage across here, then what I have is this comes from Vt minus Vs equals to L delta i off over t off, right? Over t off. This is the, again, the Difference in voltage drives a change in current, drives a change in current. So what we can do is a steady state. A steady state where I have as the two are equal to each other, right? When I have delta I out equals delta I off, the amount of change, I, the night change in current as equal, right? They have to cancel each other out. Uh, there's no permanent storage in the inductor. So you, if you look at, you, you can solve this equation through substitution. Then this gives Vt as Vs one plus T on over T off. So this is just our equation. So we can have a, Right, so I can have a, I can step up the voltage by changing the fraction time this is on versus fraction time is off. Yeah, I can change the voltage. I can change the, uh, I can change the voltage this way. Okay, so this is only a step up because you're looking at the equation that's one plus T on over T off. Right, so the smallest T on over T off can be a zero. 
And so VT, the lowest the alpha voltage can be as a as Vs. And if you switch the if you toggle the switch, you can raise the voltage up, right? You can raise the voltage as well. Okay. Any questions with this? Okay, so if not, then this is a good time for us to break for this class. So let's break until 1.38, 1.38. Then when we come back, we'll finish our DC to DC conversion. Okay. Let's stop until 1.38. Okay, all right, let's get started again. So one thing to note about this uh, calculations for the boost converter, right? For the converters is when we do power calculations, we we'll just use VT. When we do power calculations, we'll simply use the output voltage. Okay, we'll assume the output voltage is constant and we use that to do the power calculations, right? So ideally, ideally, because we have a capacitor and inductor, we want to take into account the variations in this voltage, but that turns out to be complicated. Okay, so we'll just use the average power. All right, we'll just use the average voltage in this case. We'll make the assumption that the capacitor is large enough to hold the uh, alpha voltage to be constant. Okay, so we do power calculation, we'll just use VT. Right? We won't bother with the room mean square voltage in this case. Okay, we'll just, again, this assumption comes from that capacitor is large and VT is essentially a constant in this circuit. Okay. So let's do an example, uh, do an example here. All right, so let's say I have a boost converter. Now I can step up 20 volts to 50 volts. And then again, my switching frequency is five hertz, the load is 10 ohms. Let's compute the following, right? The value of inductance that will limit the current ripple at the source side to 100 milliamps. The average current of the load, the power delivered to the source, the average current of the source. All right, so, if you look at the first question, the first part, right? What is this question really asking in the following? This question is basically saying that, hey, if you look at this calculation, this is independent of L. That's right, this is really independent of the value of L. So the value of the inductor, inductance never shows up in this equation. Okay. But what does the value of inductor control, right? So if you look at this figure, what does, if you change the value of L, what happens? Right, so I make L larger, for example, what changes in this picture? Right, so L doesn't show up in the final equation we have, right? So the step up, how much we step the voltage up by doesn't matter in L. Then what does L do? Like, then why is, you know, we said in power circuits, you're limited. I mean, the huge components are sometimes the size of the inductor. So what does a large inductor do? Right. So what does the L impact in this picture? Which of these quantities uh, actually depend on L? Uh, it changes the slope of the current graph. Um, so um, yeah, so it'll affect the size of delta I. Right, it changes delta I, right? What L does uh, basically changes delta I, right? So L, delta I is inversely proportional to L. I have a very large inductor, then delta I is small. Uh, you cannot charge, uh, you know, takes long time to increase the current, a stiff. If I have a smaller inductor, then I have a large delta I. Right? So the equation to remember is L di dt. 
as equal to the voltage or causing inductor. So it delta I, I say over T on, this is one over L times the voltage difference. Right. So the value of L, right? So the value of L, the larger the value is, the smaller the delta I. Because T on is fixed, right? T on is fixed by our switching frequency. So if I want a smaller ripple, I want a larger L. Right? So this question, the first part is basically asking, this is the limit of delta I. Right? I'm limiting my delta I to 100 milliamps. Right? I, can, I don't want to tolerate a larger sort of change in current. Okay? I don't want to tolerate a larger ripple in current. Okay? And what is the size of my inductor? Right? So how large inductor do I need to limit this kind of current ripple? Okay? So that's what the question is asking. Okay, so to find this, basically we need to find how long the switch is on and then use our equation, use our right, voltage and the inductor equation to find the value of L. So first step is to find T on. So to find T on, we use our basic equation, VT is Vs one plus T on over T off. Okay, so we have, uh, we're stepping up from 20 to 50. So we have 50 equals to 20, one plus T on over T off. We get T on over T off as 1.5. Right. So we get this as T on over T off is 1.5, but we know, we also know that T on plus T off uh, equal to the period and one over frequency, this is 0.2 milliseconds. Okay, so we can solve this equation, right? We can solve this equation. So we have T off as one point. So we can solve this equation. We have So solving, we get T on as 1.12 milliseconds, right? So this is the equation we can use to solve. Okay. All right, so then so after we solve for T on, we can use the equation that uh, VL is equal to L delta I on, over T on, okay. So we know our source voltage, right? So this V the L, this is the equation for delta I when switch is on. Okay, so as recall, if when the switch is on, our circuit is basically just this, okay? Just this circuit. So here I have the voltage across this inductor as a source voltage, right? Just a source voltage here. So we, what we have is we have VL equal to VS equals 20. So 20 volts equal to L times 100 milliamps over 0.2, over 0.12 milliseconds. Right, so if you look at the problem, so as the largest I want is 100 milliamps. So I want to limit my delta I to 100 milliamps. And this 100 milliamps is charged over 0.21 milliseconds. And it's charged by a voltage difference of 20 volts. Okay, so you solve this for L, L comes out to be 24 milliamps. Question about this? Right, so this is a fairly common, uh, this is a quite common question you'll see for step up converters for boost converters. So definitely, you know, be familiar with uh, how to do this question. 
And the end of the day, it's not all that difficult. It's basically, you have we have a uh, just a basic inductor equation. So this determines the size of inductor. And 24 millihenry may not be a small inductor. Right? This is not a tiny inductor by any means. Okay? But once these, the other parts are sort of uh, more straightforward, right? The average current, this is just Vt over R, right? So it's a voltage powering a resistor. So this is just 50 over 10, five amps. The power, as we said, we're gonna assume the output voltage is constant. Okay, so this is just simply V times I, the average values. So this is Vt times It, 50 times five, 250 watts power circuit. Then how do I find the source current? What is the source current? Right. So I know the output, I know the source voltage, I know the output current, for example, but what's my source current? Any ideas on how to find this? Right, so what's conserving this circuit? So I know the power, right? So here we calculate the output power, but the power is conserving this circuit, right? So the power, the output power is exactly equal to the input power, right? Right, so if you look at our convergence circuit, there's nowhere for this circuit to lose power. Okay. This, this is nowhere for this circuit to lose power. Right? It's basically to a C and L. Okay. So the power is conserved from input to output. So then if we do this question, we know that this is the same power divided by the input, the source voltage. So that's 250 over 20, and we get 12.5 amps, okay? So another governing equation for all this converter is, since we never have a resistor inside the converter itself, right? So all these converters conserve power, right? So equal power, power in equals power out. And this does make it easy to find the current. Yeah, this makes it easy to find things like current. So again, here is we're going to assume the average is good enough for power calculations. We're not going to worry about, you know, the current is actually not a constant, right? So this sort of ripple. Right? So we're not going to worry about the fact that current ripples. Okay, we're, all we're going to do is we're going to say the average, you know, we're going to assume think the ripples are small enough such that we can just use averages for power calculations. Okay? So there are more refined calculations you can make. But uh, we're not going to do that here. Okay, we're going to simply average this. Right, any questions about this? Okay, so this is our current calculation, right? So, and then last we come to our buck boost comfort. Right? So this is our step up or down but that's something that can reverse the polarity of the input versus respect to output. Okay. So it's basically another version, another version of the sort of the boost converter. You just swap where the inductor the, and the diode and the switch goes. Okay, so we just basically you swap the inductor and the switch and you reverse the diode. And the reason you reverse the diode is you want to make sure that we, we can reverse the polarity, right? So we want to pull current out of VT this way, right? So we want this as the, we want to pull current this way. Okay? We want to pull current 
out of this resistor this way. So it has a negative voltage, right? So sort of there's negative in sign to the source current. Right? Otherwise, the same principle as before, your inductor stores, right? inductor acts as a storage device. And depending when the current is on and off, we can, when the switch is on and off, we can work out the change in current, we work out the change in current, we can work out the relationship between the output and input voltage. So this is very similar to the calculation we've done before. So let's just go through this calculation again. Let's go through the calculation again. Right. Right. So and the calculation is quite actually easy in this case, right? So when the switch is on, okay, if you look at this curve, when the switch is on, then from the inductor's perspective, you basically have a voltage connected to the inductor. Okay. Right. So you have a directly voltage across the inductor. The rest of the circuit doesn't matter for the inductor's point of view because you have a voltage directly in parallel to the inductor. Okay, so the rest of the circuit doesn't matter. In this case, I don't care what the load is doing. All I want to know is the change uh, in the current in the inductor. So if you look at this change, then basically the source is the inductance times delta ion over T L. Then when this is off, right? So when this switch is off, then all I have is this inductor powering the circuit. I have this inductor powering the circuit. So we can do the computation again, and we get the VL equal to minus L I off times over T off. And this is a voltage over VT, right? So the negative sign come from the fact that we're pulling the current out this way. Okay, we're pulling the current out of the inductor downwards and sending it up. So this, this is where the negative sign comes from. Okay. Yeah, so we have a negative sign in front of this. And then when we look, we end up with this governing equation. As the output is minus P on over T off. So if we want to boil everything down, that's just the uh, fundamental equation we get. All right, so we can, any question about this? The analysis is quite similar to the boost converter case. It, you just figure out, you know, when it's on and off, you look at the circuit. So for average analysis, this is quite easy to get this for average value conversion. Okay, so with that, then the last thing we're gonna look at is AC-AC converter, which is a very short topic for us, right? So our AC-AC converter is basically a AC to DC. You put a capacitor, okay? You put a capacitor in the middle and then you have a DC to AC circuit again. And this is our AC to AC converter. So what does a capacitor do? Any ideas? Why why is there a capacitor in the why is there a capacitor in the middle? You actually need this capacitor. So we, we do need a capacitor. But why is this capacitor here? Is it to limit fluctuations? It is to limit fluctuations. So how does it exactly achieve that? Maybe to isolate the two converters from each other so the switching of one doesn't affect the switching of the other. Right, so basically we have a capacitor, right, what capacitor? Well, it lies a DC component do, right? So what this does is, is basically if I have noise on both sides, this will sort of decouple the noise a little bit. Right? So this is sort of the, this capacitor decouples both sides because it's again, it's sort of trying to hold the voltage at a constant value. So if you have small noises on both sides, but because the voltage across the capacitor cannot change instantaneously, the capacitor tried to oppose voltage change. So what this capacitor does is it sort of uh, 
isolate the noise, right? So, so the noise doesn't show up from one side to the other side. So this is an isolating capacitor. You see this kind of capacitor. So this is it to us for AC to AC converter. Uh, for us, we just, you know, for us, we'll just assume that the DC side is, is we have one AC to DC. And if we need, we may need to step the voltage up or step the voltage down. We may need to change the frequency. We may need to change the phase. And that can be done by the other DC to AC converter. Okay, so this is what our AC to AC converter does. So we'll cover the rest actually next lecture. So this lecture will finish up by looking at the, some more practical consequences, for example, a circuit like this, right? So as we said, when you look at a electronic circuit, a lot of the real estate is dominated by the power, power electronics, right? by the inductor. As right? so you look at any motherboard, you have this sort of coil, so that's just an inductor that's sitting there. And uh, so is there any way we can reduce the size of the inductor? Right, so we want to make everything smaller, right? We want to you know, make phones, uh, basically we want to make you know, all this, we want to squeeze more things into the same real list, I say this, right? So, you know, so we have a form factor and uh, given the form factor of let's say a phone, I want more computing or I want a bigger battery or you know, I want this kind of things not a huge inductor right, sitting there to do power conversion purposes. So any idea on how to reduce this? Let's say you figure out the inductor is really large and you want to you know, use a smaller inductor, let's say. Any idea how to do, right? So increase frequency, right? So, right, so the chance has increased frequency so that idea is come from, if you look at us, right? so if you look at the inductor, so what does the inductor do, right? What the inductor does basically try to limit the current ripple, right? limit current ripple. If you look at the current ripple equation, there's two things you can control. Right? One is the fact that you have a, right? so if you look at the current ripple, delta i, move t on to the other side, one over L times T on times V. Right? You can make L larger to reduce this current ripple, or you can make T on smaller. Right? To make T on smaller, you have to make T off also smaller as well. Right? So there's current ripple shows up in both sides. But basically you have to switch at a higher frequency. Right? So if you can switch at a very high frequency, that reduces the current ripple in the system. So you can get away with this you know, small inductor, right? You can't get away with a small inductor. But the what, so what, what's the drawback of switching things at a very high frequency? Okay, so switching at five kilohertz is trivial nowadays. You want to switch at hundred megahertz, we can switch at hundred megahertz. Right? So we have, you know, our computers goes in gigahertz. Range, right? So switching at 100 megahertz is not difficult. Right? So having driving the circuit at 100 megahertz. But why don't we just switch everything at 100 megahertz? Right? Why does your iPhone still have this or this inductor of this size inside of it? Why not switch things at super high frequency and uh, maybe get away with a tiny, so switching loss. So what causes the switching to have losses? Right, so it's correct. If you switch at a very high frequency, you suddenly should have losses in the system. But which component are you losing power on? So this is our circuit. Which of these loses, which of these experience loss if I switch at a very high frequency? So your switches are all pretty efficient. The switch itself is not very lost. So you, you, again, use a MOSFET to switch as this sort of, we can switch computers at uh, gigahertz. So switching, the switch itself switching is not terribly difficult. But what, what is a loss when you switch at high frequency? Now the dial, 
not the diode. The chat says diode, not the diode. Diode does it. Diode turns out to be really simple. I don't lose diode. Right, it's a capacitor. <laughs> There's a loss. So there is an FC square loss, where you, if your frequency is really, really, really high, your capacitor now starts to experience losses in this switch. Okay, so that's sort of, if you make a capacitor, the capacitor starts to conduct a little bit and uh, you have losses. And this for high switching tends to uh, not be so good to the capacitor, okay, to the capacitor we have. And this capacitor tends to fail under very high switching frequency. Okay, so now the innovation nowadays, or a lot of innovation associated with the material side of this is, I want to really switch at high frequency, but then I want to use a, either a different material for a capacitor or some other tricks to reduce the loss and not kill my capacitor when I switch at high frequency. And so a lot of research is happening in this domain. Right? It's, re it's really sort of, there's no free lunch. It's not that you, know, you switch more and more faster and faster, everything becomes easier. There's still challenges, namely the capacitor design. Right? So that's something to keep in mind, right? When we talk about switching frequency, you always see that in our problems, it seems the higher the switching frequency, the better everything is. Smaller inductor, smaller current ripple, you know, less variation of the output, things like that. But there is a loss associated with it that comes from the sort of the capacitor side of the circuit. Okay, so now there's the innovation of, you know, can we find the materials for, for capacitors that tolerate this very fast switching? Is there a smart way to do the switching to be not so stressful? Things like this that's happening on the uh, research side. Okay. Right. Any questions about that or about the converters? Okay, all right. So if not, then uh, let's end here. So again, Thursday is midterm. After, so for the midterm, I will post another link for the lecture type, right? So we'll, the lecture for on Thursday is basically converting to the office hour where we can ask questions for the midterm. We won't use this link because this link is open. And uh, you know, when you ask questions, people tend to show me what they're doing. So we'll convert it to a waiting room style that has uh, the waiting room style that has a, so when we, ha we have sort of one person at a time coming, right? So we'll show out for that link on Thursday. So uh, good luck with the midterm and next time we'll start on type three. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>